please uh, introduce yourself and tell us what you do and yeah, why you are here. We will start with Kenny. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Kay Kayali Mwicha. Uh, in the movement, I'm known as Kenny Mwicha, and I am a human rights and public policy specialist. So my name is Joyce. I am a feminist based in Mombasa. I coordinate activities at Pwani Feminist Com Community of Feminists, uh, inclusive of uh, trans persons, sex persons, and sex workers, too. I am a queer person, a mother, and I'm just so glad to be here. Thank you so much. Um, so our discussion today, following up on, on yesterday's webinars, where, the webinar where we had uh, invited uh, participants from the LGBTQ uh, community to discuss like the election period and what it, what it is that they can, like they can know and be well prepared especially when we're going through this period where we know elections can be intense. And especially for the community, we know how this goes. We've been here, we've experienced many elections that have, been, that have happened in the past. So because of that, um, I was just wondering, because you've been working closely with uh, things to do with policy making, Kenny, um, what is it that you think can be, like in this age of social media, how can you, like how can the LGBTQ community spot fake news? Like relating to, like targeting LGBTQ individuals, especially during these campaigns and with politicians using LGBTQ persons for their own agenda. Like, how can they be aware of fake news and not just take information and run with it? Yeah. All right, thank you for that answer, Donna. I think for me, uh, one way of uh, detecting fake news or like preventing yourself from being influenced by fake news is to always like try and verify information that you receive. So um, in my experience, uh, I will, rarely take especially to you you need to know or to identify kind of like how fake news uh works and the way fake news works it, it uses sensational information and the sensational presentation of information to kind of like manipulate you um into having a certain sense of you know like a certain range of feelings so it can be anger it can be joy it can be anxiety mm -hmm. or fear and so mm -hmm. like uh when you see those uh, feelings rise and you know, like you're really being compelled to take a certain position, I think it's good for you to take a break or take a moment to actually verify the information through other means. Um, mm -hmm. And also I think that we need to understand that we are living in an age where there's a lot of disinformation. There's a yeah. lot of uh, falsehoods that are being perpetuated and this is happening through um, especially social media, um, and especially places where it's difficult to fact check information, for example, on messaging apps such as WhatsApp or Telegram mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. that's kind of like how you start taking those steps. It, it, is it is important to know that we are living in that environment. It is important to know that certain uh, events or scenarios like you know lead to the proliferation of fake news and i could give just mm -hmm. a couple of examples uh the covid19 pandemic has really brought in a new age of fake news and disinformation which is very difficult to stamp out uh political mm -hmm. events uh such as you know like the kenyan general election that's going to take place later this year also bring with them like a lot of like fake news uh, which is being perpetuated by people who have an interest in presenting or distorting information in a particular way. Um, mm -hmm. And also global events uh, such as the war in Ukraine, for example, that could uh, also bring in opportunities like for fake news, like to really proliferate. Um, so to just know that you're in that, we are living in that environment. Um, every time you see, uh, especially from not very trusted news, you know, like you're seeing someone post something on social media, it's not linking to like a news article. 
etc mm -hmm. use of screenshots use of like videos that cannot be independently verified i think that's a good first place to like have like that level of skepticism that you might be someone might be trying to manipulate you using fake news yeah Wow, thank you so much. That was very comprehensive. And especially right now with um, people wanting to have an opinion on everything, with news coming from everywhere, it's very, like it's important to first of all verify the information before you, like you run with it. Because the moment you run with something that is fake, then that is going to be causing like more problems. So yeah, thank you so much for that uh, response. Um, we will go to Joyce. Since you mentioned that you do a lot of work with feminists in Kisumu, you mentioned. Um, are there Kenyan websites that you know or credible, credible information when it comes to knowing about the general election, like live, like to monitor what is happening, um, the places that people need to um, avoid in an election. Very active on Twitter. And the um, site or the news outlets that I trust the most are the ones that are verified, the handles are verified. And we have a lot of bloggers who have been verified. And what they do is they they post fake news, fake news on any, on even, something as, uh, as, as simple as crowd, uh, that crowds that they've managed to pull, quote unquote. You find that some bloggers use um, pictures of crowds from a rally in like a, a country, like maybe at a Cuba or Cameroon, some uprising uh, demonstration somewhere else. And then they come and say, oh, today's uh, rally was successful. And I think it's to boost their uh, levels of, you know, confidence or to tell people that they have numbers. So what I do is the bloggers are completely blacklisted from my mind that I cannot take any kind of news from them. Any kind of news from them is automatically fake news to me, unless it, are, it is backed by um but by media outlets of we who we who, who also have their shortcomings because sometimes they report fake news and then it gets embarrassing and they have to delete it but i'm sure with this election period they have to be extremely careful with what they post because um, anything can bring tension everybody right now is on high alert i mean given our history given our past with the violence pre, pre post election so what I do is I trust media outlets and I also don't trust um, um, uh, communication directors uh, employed by um, politicians, by prominent politicians, because they are also like propaganda machines too. So it's mostly media outlets or websites or um, what else, um, um, the police, um, the police handles, the Twitter police handles, because they also sometimes when they want to, they post um, um, pictures or videos of demonstrations. And also common regular Monanchi, uh, they post, um, uh, for example, videos of violence happening. And you have to go through the comments first before believing and retweeting. Because in the comment section, there's always one sober person saying, no, this happened in 2019 in, in in Sri Lanka, this is not Kenya. So you have to always double check your facts be before sharing it. And especially if it's news about um, unrest somewhere, citizen arrest somewhere, it's something that uh, you have to double check first before sharing or cases of violence. Although I, I, I tend not to share um, cases of um, like images or videos of extreme violence and gore or bloody scenes because I feel like it's it's too sensitive information to share. So I usually just check and, and Google or, or um, you know, ask around with somebody who maybe lives in that city or town so that I can get my facts right. You mentioned that um, it's important to verify information before you post it and even the media outlets that are going to be sharing news about the elections. People need to make sure 
that before they share this information online, like on their social media pages, they verify this information and they make sure that they're not just posting videos from past elections or from other countries. So then um, I am also curious, now that we, we know that, I know for sure that the registration process is almost actually it's done, but then um, is it possible to um, like if if I know there are people who don't know that they, if they voted in the past they can still be able to just use the same registration card to vote now. Um, is there a way to share this information with people so that they are not uh, misinformed when it comes to like if if they want to vote like they should be aware of this information. So where can people be sent to, to find this information about uh, election registration and how to go about uh, finding this information on, on the social media pages? Is it found on the um, IEBC pages? Is it found on, like, is there a specific page that they need to go to or website to get this information about voter, voter registration? I've been looking at the uh, IBC um, website and it's not really saying much about um, if you want to switch your vote um, from uh, a difference, I mean, between different constituencies. But yesterday during our webinar, I had told the uh, participants that you can only go to your local IBC office. There's always one in every town. To that uh, IBC office and, and tell them that you want to switch from, um, uh, let's say, Langata to Vita constituency. And I had uh, feedback from some participants that somebody was told to go with a letter from the chief that it's, that says that, oh, now this one lives in, in Vita constituency and not no longer in Langata. So, um, mm. Okay, in here, Asa, I didn't hear any I didn't know about going with uh, Barua Chief. But then again, if Barua, uh, you can always go to the IBC, check out their their requirements because I'm very sure that this thing, um, the requirements maybe can can be um, different in some places because some people maybe want to be really thorough. Some IBC officials mm -hmm. want to be really thorough about um, uh, you are, you know, resident. So mm -hmm. it's really to go to the IBC office and check what the re their requirements are, and then uh, go back and get them all together so that you can change your, your voter uh, situation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, Kenny, um, <laughs> this is your question. Are there any Kenyan used to be blamed for their election apathy? Like the attitude towards election? Is there a reason, a specific reason why Kenyan youth are very skeptical about the elections? And you will find people saying, me, I will not vote because since I have I voted or since I've seen these leaders, there's nothing they've done to like to to better my life. So why do you think? This is so, yeah? Like, why do you think there is so much like hatred towards election period? And is there a way that we can improve this? Do you think there is hope that this might ever change? Yeah. Um, I think in terms of uh, voter apathy, it's understandable for kind of like, you know, young people and other marginalized mm -hmm. groups to be quite apathetic about the elections. Uh, there are a lot of groups, not just young people who are apathetic about the, uh, who are apathetic uh, regarding the elections. Uh, I could include in that group women, person with, uh, persons with disability, um, some members of kind of like, you know, like the urban poor, for example, and even the rural poor. And also I would say that LGBTIQ people also are quite apathetic regarding the elections, just based on my conversations with members of our community. And this is, this straddles uh, class. So like you have, like, you know, regardless of your income level or your educational level, 
uh, you know, your gender, your sexual orientation or gender identity, and even your sex characteristics, all of them, like, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a strong kind of, like, disinterest in engaging in the electoral process. And I think that part of what, uh, part of what that is on account of is because um, all these groups, all these marginalized groups do not feel adequately represented, um, you know, like, in the office of the president or in the office of their governor or their women's rep or even their MP and MCA, Senate ITC. And once you mm -hmm. feel like you're, you're not being represented or your interests are also not being uh, represented, um, then you truly like, you know, you usually kind of like start stepping back away from engaging with that system. It's not a good use of your time, for example, yeah. to be politically mo motivated or conscious because like no matter what you do or no matter what you advocate for the things that you'd really like to see from your government are not being like they're not being implemented or like they're not being addressed by those in power i would yeah. say that it would take a lot uh it would take a lot for us to kind of like address voter apathy uh in kenyan society uh number one is uh i would say that it would perhaps like be a multi-year project there are kind of like also things that the government or those in put in power do to kind of like discourage people from fully engaging in the vote uh or in the electoral process in kenya uh number one is curtailing civic education so kind of like there is not a culture that promotes voting in the country uh, mm -hmm. There are no efforts that are made other than voter registration to encourage people to vote or to participate in the electoral process uh, number two is also kind of like just disillusionment with the government that uh, that is kind of like, you know, very active in uh, in our society. Actually, I would say that if uh, politicians didn't pay bribes in Kenya, I strongly suspect that we wouldn't be having um, a lot of like uh, engagement with the electoral process. But usually for you to kind of like receive the bribes, uh, I've, I've seen stories, you know, kind of like where they... Uh, require you to come with maybe a photo of your of your ballot as well as like you know like your yeah. hat has been dipped in the ink or something like that so that's even even politicians recognize that voter apathy is quite a big thing so that when you're paying a bribe you're not only paying a bribe for someone to vote for you you're also paying a bribe for someone to vote period so you have to kind of like convince them to go um I, I think those are the issues around like voter apathy, unless you really change the political system so that it starts working uh, the way it should, which is that, you know, we're in a representative democracy and, you know, like our elected officials are supposed to kind of like uh, cater to the needs of like diverse groups of people, unless you solve that. Um, then it would be very difficult to organize people to vote. I think some of the things we can do in the short uh, term is to just kind of like raise awareness. Um, yeah. among the groups that we are targeting to kind of like figure out even more effective ways of engaging in the political process. And I don't know what exactly that would look like. Um, perhaps maybe like, you know, setting up, you know, I, I really don't know, but I, but you have to kind of like figure out how you can reach out to key constituencies and encourage them to participate in the electoral process. Even though the gains are not visible immediately, they start engaging in these processes, yeah. Okay. I, I think it's important to continue with the conversation because even with the civic education that we have rolled out for LGBTQ individuals, it's because we have seen how even civic education in this country is, is done. Like, especially when we're almost uh, that time for elections, you hear campaigns are everywhere. Right now, there are campaigns everywhere. The roads are full of people, politicians, campaigning, telling people, giving people empty promises. And it's just unfortunate that even as an LGBT person, you'd never imagine or picture yourself being in those spaces because you never really know how that situation might turn out. So I feel like even as an LGBTQ person, already you are not included in that process. And that is why, like, and it's, 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 it's unfortunate because we're still citizens of this country. We still pay taxes. We still do all the things that other citizens do. But then when it comes to these other things, we have never thought of. We are not, like, they are not intentional about creating safe spaces 
for us to be in them, yeah? And I feel like that is why we took this initiative to make sure that we start this conversation, we start this process, and at least we might not solve everything, but we will get somewhere with the little information that we'll be able to share by the time the election is here, we'll be able to have our community um, having the awareness and also being informed. And also now, if they're going to make a decision about voting, they are making it from an informed place. Because at the end of the day, people need to have the community, like they need to have the information to make an informed decision or choice. Yeah, so thank you so much. Um, I think I wasn't like going to ask so many questions, but let's continue with this conversation, both online and offline. And I'm very happy that um, I was able to have this conversation with the two of you. And yeah, it is a pleasure to have you board. Thank you, Kenny, thank you, Joyce. And hopefully we can continue with this conversation more until the process of election. Mm -hmm.